Hi and welcome to the big epic engineering channel where we look at very big buildings. Today's subject is Egypt's new administrative capital, a futuristic metropolis built from scratch by the Egyptian government. We've all heard of big mega projects before, but what makes this one truly stand out is its sheer bigness. So what does this big epic project entail? The Middle East's biggest mega cathedral, two big mega mosques, one of them Egypt's biggest, the world's biggest skyscraper and two dozen more, the Capitol Park, twice as big as Central Park to promote social interactions. There's also the world's biggest military headquarters, aka the Octagon, a whole new district for all the Egyptian ministries, a smaller district with all the important institutions, a big area called People's Square with the world's biggest flagpole and two theaters, and a big 20-lane road for military parades, plus a monument as big as a whole neighborhood, two new parliament buildings, a big new presidential palace, the biggest automated monorail system in the world, and, to top it all off, an American-style suburb. So this is Egypt's new administrative capital in a nutshell. Wait, what's that? This project is pointless at best and incredibly harmful at worst? B but, but it's big! What? The sheer size and scope of a project alone does not make it good? But, 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 but big buildings! Look, look at how big they are! Bigly big! They're so big! Huh? Oh no, what is this? Oh no. So much for algorithm-generated urbanism content. Looks like we'll have to do this the old-fashioned way after all. So Egypt's new administrative capital. It is a truly enormous undertaking by the Egyptian government, its scale only surpassed by its sheer stupidity. When discussing this project, we have to ask ourselves, what is wrong with a dictator building a colossal vanity project in the desert from scratch in a country where the minimum wage is $127 per month? Let's find out. The new administrative capital was already a dumb idea, but with a few bold steps they've managed to reach unprecedented levels of idiocy, where, in my opinion, they have managed to surpass even Dubai. I'm not exaggerating. Like the saying goes, smooth brain dictator plus construction project equals dumb shit. shit, shit, shit. And oh boy, do we have some of that here, courtesy of Desert Ceausescu. As the name shows, the project itself is meant to create an all-new administrative center for the Egyptian government, moving them out of central Cairo. This isn't the first of such projects. The new administrative capital is right next to New Cairo City, built by the previous dictator, which is a 500 square kilometer gentrified car-centric urban hellscape. So Egypt's current dictator, Abdel Fattah al Sisi, took a look at New Cairo City and thought, yeah, we can build something bigger than that. And so the new administrative capital was born. So let's go over the major parts of this project to explain why exactly they're stupid, or in this case, outright evil. First, the obvious stuff. Both the world's tallest flagpole and the world's tallest skyscraper, because fuck it, why not? The flagpole is of course nothing more than nationalistic dick waving. As for the skyscraper, if you've been watching my content before, you know why it's a bad idea, especially in the desert. To reiterate, there's just no good reason to build skyscrapers. The higher you build, the more engineering problems you have to solve, and the more expensive things get. Even if you're after the largest possible floor space, you're still better off with mid-rises. In my video about skyscrapers, I've illustrated how the Burj Khalifa, the world's current tallest skyscraper, could be outdone in terms of floor space by building five mid-rise commie blocks on its footprint. Otherwise, skyscrapers waste a ton of energy by virtue of being giant hunks of glass and steel. Their price per square meter is significantly higher than mid-rises, and they alienate people by complicating access to public spaces such as parks and so on. Now, there are some edge cases where you have no choice but to build skyscrapers on very small footprints and very close to each other because you simply have no available space. But, as you can see, for the new administrative capital, space is in really an issue by virtue of it being out in the open desert. So why does Egypt want to build the world's tallest skyscraper plus two dozen more? The same reason as the flagpole, i.e. as part of the international dictator's dick-waving contest. Dictators really do love building big dumb things for no reason. Germania is a good example, which was Hitler's renewal plan for Berlin that was mostly about redoing the city center with overly large buildings. One of them was a triumphal arch seen in the middle, which was supposed to be so large the Paris Arc de Triomphe would have fit under it. Hitler also envisioned a square, the Grand Plaza, which was supposed to be 350,000 square meters. Here it is overlaid on inner city Prague. Today's dictators prefer skyscrapers though, because that's what's trendy nowadays. Hence the new administrative capital containing two dozen of them, one of which is to be the world's tallest as mentioned. Between those skyscrapers and what appears to be two 10-lane urban freeways lies the Capitol Park, now called the Green River Park, the purpose of which is providing shade and encouraging social activities. Great! I love it when my parks provide shade and encourage social activities. Corporate bullet points aside, the real purpose of this park is to be six times the size of Central Park. That's it. And considering you're creating a 2,509 hectare lawn in the middle of the desert, the water consumption of this thing will be beyond belief, which I'm sure will do wonders for stability in the region. Ethiopia's casus belli for launching a water war will be Egyptians watering their lawn. 
However, skyscrapers, flagpoles and disturbingly large parks are the least of our worries here, if you can believe that. Let's take a look at the residential areas envisioned in the project. In terms of urbanism, they are complete bonkers. The most obvious problem is that most areas are completely car-centric, that means blocks of residential buildings divided by large roads and 6 to 8 lane arterial roads with minimal to no public transit. The worst offender might be La Vista City here, which is an American-style suburb in the desert next to a freeway bordered by an arterial road. Now there are plenty of videos out there detailing why American suburbs are the worst Thing you can build. For now, let's just say they isolate people socially, force you to be car dependent, services and amenities are far away, it's near impossible to have good public transit due to low density, it's much more expensive to drag out utilities to each house, and so on. Long story short, American suburbs are an urbanism nightmare. Back to Egypt, there's the R5 residential area, a district with fake French architecture. You know how primitive oligarchs and their children love ultra expensive French luxury goods? The R5 is basically that, just on a whole other level. By the way, in the new administrative capital, the only meaningful public transit will be a high speed rail line, and that's good, but they're also building a monorail line, because of course they are. This one will cost 4.5 billion dollars. But you already have the metro, it's right there, why not just extend that? Why create a whole new system which has significantly lower capacity than a metro line? This whole new standalone rich people's transportation, neatly separated from public transit for the poors. What a strange coincidence, huh? Aside from the monorail, the whole new administrative capital is of course completely car centric. Here we have a render of the R3 residential area, which looks like something a six year old would build in SimCity 3000 with the money cheat on. It's all urban freeways. After all, public transit is for the unwashed masses, not the elite. Yes, if you thought all this was being built for the ordinary Egyptian, then I got some prime real estate to sell you out in the Sahara. According to this Reuters article, some 22 million Egyptians live in slums to this day, which is a quarter of the country's entire population. Is anything being done to better their situation? In four years, the government managed to relocate 750,000 people from slums to social housing. At this rate, assuming the slums population won't grow, clearing all of them will take 117 years. Well, to be fair, the Egyptian government has more important things to spend on. The world's tallest flagpole isn't gonna build itself. Also, low-income families from slums are often relocated into car-centric areas, which severely restrict their mobility. These areas are also heavily segregated from higher-income neighborhoods and risk becoming slums all over again. The issue here is, of course, the Egyptian government's socio-economic priorities, best illustrated by this picture of an urban freeway being built in Cairo, approximately one meter away from people's windows. Otherwise, a very telling example is the fate of the so-called Maspero Triangle, which is a slum area not far from Tahrir Square in central Cairo, home to some 18,000 people. In the 90s, under the previous dictator, the authorities forbade doing any repair work on the houses under threat of heavy fines. Soon enough, buildings started collapsing, often with their inhabitants inside, thus forced evictions began due to quote-unquote unsafe conditions. This didn't really stop until the 2011 Egyptian Revolution, where the Maspero slum became a hotbed for revolutionaries, providing essential support for those protesting on Tahrir Square. In the end, Egypt of course ended up with a different dictator, who decided to finish the job and had the entire area bulldozed. 18,000 people were forcibly evicted so that a gentrified high-rise area can be built there. Hashtag guess the poor. And the new administrative capital is not much different in terms of social value. All this is being built not for the ordinary person, but for the ruling class and their allies. It is, in large part, meant to solidify the dictatorship by insulating the leadership from common people. It's significantly harder to overthrow your government when the parliament is 12 hours away on foot in the desert and you have to break through 20 military checkpoints to get there. The other half of the story is, of course, money. Within the company responsible for the project, the military happens to be a majority shareholder. That company is also responsible for selling and operating all that ultra expensive property left empty by moving the government to the district they're building. The Egyptian military really is a state within a state. The dictatorship, thus the country, is held together by them. They are the true Egyptian ruling class. The ultimate symbol of this is the most ludicrous element of the project, the octagon. The octagon is the Egyptian military's new headquarters. In terms of military power, Egypt is on par with Italy, but apparently they need an HQ eight times the size of the Pentagon, which makes it, you guessed it, the largest in the world. But the octagon is more than just a military headquarters. Around this abomination, there are housing complexes, public services, amenities, and so on, making the octagon a city within a city. And this is deliberate, of course. What we have here is a brand new castle for the Egyptian military ruling class. So in the new administrative capital, we have district for the Egyptian upper class, the political class, a castle for the military ruling class, a whole bunch of world's largest ex-bullshit projects, and a new palace for the dictator, all neatly separated from the riffraff. Meanwhile, Cairo's problems are numerous and severe. Aside from the aforementioned 
slums and general poverty, urban planning in Cairo is either non-existent or beyond insane. According to TomTom, it is the 30th most congested city on the planet. No wonder. Traffic management as a concept doesn't exist in Cairo. Traffic rules are a suggestion and nobody will check compliance. Crossing the road as a pedestrian is an incredibly risky maneuver and not looking around beforehand is practically suicide. Also, did you know that Cairo, the 7th largest metro area on the planet, barely operates any traffic lights? Vehicle safety is a foreign concept. On the picture you can see an old 5-seater Soviet car packed absolutely full with children. Because this is a school bus. Yep. According to the WHO, every year approximately 12,000 Egyptians die in road accidents, a number both insane and unsurprising. Meanwhile, public transit is woefully underdeveloped. For example, the Greater Cairo area of 20.9 million people is currently served by two and a half metro lines. In contrast, the Paris metro area of 15 million people is served by 16 metro lines and five major suburban rail lines. There are some tram lines in Cairo, but the ones in the center were demolished long ago and what remains is more of a rolling museum than a transit system. Beyond these, there's a municipal bus system that exists, and below that, the most crucial part of Cairo's public transit, minibuses. The website Discover Discomfort in their article described them like so. Riding a microbus takes practice. It's hard to get the right one, as you have to master certain hand signals and codes to be able to discern which to get. E.g. a fist takes us to our neighborhood, Doki. It's hard to sit in the right place in a microbus, judging where isn't too close to the front, so you're in everyone's way, and where isn't too deep, so everyone is in yours. And it's hard to get off, knowing what to yell and when, and diving off in the 10 seconds you have to make it happen. As you can see, this is not a serious public transit system, more like a half-baked haphazard mess that kinda sorta functions because it has to, just like the city of Cairo as a whole. And the leadership does not care. Instead, they're spending money on the aforementioned monorail between the new administrative capital and East Cairo, costing $4.5 billion. Imagine what could have been done inside Cairo for that kind of money. But instead, they opted for a shiny gadget bomb bullshit project because spending money on Cairo would serve the poor, while the monorail will serve the upper classes. Other parts of this project are just further insult to injury. The Unknown Soldier Monument is just a handout to military adjacent real estate companies. Also got all the giant and ink symbols all around, it's about as subtle as the character design in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. And here I'd like to take a brief aside and voice my overall disappointment with quote-unquote urbanism content on YouTube. I hate how many content creators almost never examine any project beyond look how big it is. It is my belief that urbanism-related content should be more than just bamboozling people with big numbers and CGI. You should look at whom the project is built for, how it affects people, i.e. its socio-economic costs and benefits. In lieu of that, you're just jangling keys in front of a bunch of babies. And also get a hundred million views in the process. In general, if you can replace your audio with a Donald Trump-level self-aggrandizing bullshit speech with stock music and not lose much of the information value, you might want to rethink your video. Look, I know skyscrapers, I love skyscrapers, many of my best friends are skyscrapers, this is the best skyscraper ever constructed, ever, billions and billions of square feet, most tall in the world, bigly built, big business activities, very big business. At the end of the day, urbanism is more than just building some big, shiny buildings. It's the built environment we humans are meant to inhabit. A building on its own is just a heap of bricks, metal and concrete. Its intended purpose, the kind of people it will serve, its location, accessibility, those are what make a building worth talking about. But very often these quote-unquote urbanism channels only focus on the physical object and some easy-to-marketable numbers, nothing more. Sure, the new administrative capital looks impressive, lots of big buildings, big, big buildings, but that alone tells us nothing about what it really is. A dictator's bullshit vanity project Project at the expense of tens of millions who are forced to live in poverty for decades to come. But it didn't have to be this way. Egyptian authorities could have put their traffic management in order, create a workable municipal bus system, build new metro lines, more affordable housing, and they could have improved Cairo's chaotic urban planning. Instead, they chose to build a $40 billion monument to hubris and sociopathy, brainlessly celebrated by people who ought to know better. Welcome to Egypt's new administrative capital, where buildings are big and brains are smooth. Following my desert mega project tradition, I'll leave you with a poem. This one is titled Ozymandias by Percy B. Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stemmed on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lowland level sands stretch far away.